If you're studying AP Bio Unit 3 Cellular Energetics, then you might be feeling nervous or anxious because AP Bio Unit 3 is a tough unit. It includes topics like cellular respiration and photosynthesis. But don't worry. The goal of this video is to teach you everything that you need to know to crush that next unit exam or the AP Bio test. Here's what we're going to cover. We're going to start with enzymes, then we'll move on to cellular energy and ATP. That'll lead us into photosynthesis, where we'll look at the big picture, the light reactions, and the Calvin cycle. We'll end with cellular respiration. Again, the big picture, glycolysis, the link reaction in the Krebs cycle, and we'll end with the electron transport chain. My name is Glenn Wokenfeld. I'm a retired AP biology teacher, and I love teaching B-I-O-L-O-G-Y. When I taught AP bio in the classroom, most of my students got fours and fives on the AP bio exam, and I'm hoping to do the same for you. I'm also the author of the learn-biology.com AP bio curriculum and the Biomania AP bio app. I'll tell you more about those later. To get ready for this video, I drew upon my decades of experience as an AP Bio teacher, and I also analyzed the College Board's course and exam description to see the standards and objectives for Unit 3. I've put those into a very student-friendly study guide. It's great for studying, and you can download it. The link is below. Topics 3.1 to 3.3, enzymes. Describe the key properties of enzymes. Enzymes are usually proteins. There are some RNAs that act like enzymes that catalyze reactions in cells. They lower the activation energy of the reactions that they catalyze, increasing the rate of those reactions. So in this diagram, you see a reaction that's catalyzed by an enzyme, number two, and a reaction that's not catalyzed at number one. And the difference is that the activation energy for the enzyme-catalyzed reaction is much less than the non-enzyme-catalyzed reaction. Enzymes are highly specific because their active site complements the shape and charge of their substrate, which is the substance that an enzyme acts upon. So here's an active site. Here's the substrate. This is the enzyme as a whole. It would be a large protein. Here's the enzyme interacting with the substrate. And here we have the products. Enzymes are both highly specific and have a narrow set of conditions where they can function at or near their optimum. Explain. Enzymes are proteins with secondary, tertiary, and quaternary level structures that involve hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, and hydrophobic clustering. Changing pH, temperature, or ion concentration interferes with these bonds, changing the shape of the active site, keeping the enzyme from binding with its substrate. Enzymes, therefore, have a pH, ionic, or temperature optimum at which the shape of their active site best fits their substrate. Environmental change can cause denaturation, a change in the shape of the enzyme that lowers or completely negates enzyme function. Describe how enzyme activity is affected by changes in the pH of its environment. Most enzymes have a pH optimum where they operate at peak efficiency. Here's the optimum right here. As pH moves above or below the optimum, enzyme performance drops. And this is the rate of enzyme activity, and you can see that as the pH drops, it goes down. As the pH increases, it goes down. Why? It's for all the reasons we talked about in the previous slide. It's that enzymes are proteins. If you change the pH, you disrupt the bonds that hold that protein in its specific shape. The result is denaturation and less good fit between the enzyme and its substrate. Describe how enzyme activity is affected by changes in the temperature of the enzyme's environment. Up to a certain point, enzyme activity increases with temperature, and that's because there's more kinetic energy that increases molecular motion, and it increases the chance that the enzyme will bind with its substrate and therefore be able to catalyze the reaction. But at a certain temperature, beyond two in the graph, the enzyme will denature. It'll change its shape, reducing the enzyme's catalytic abilities because it'll no longer be able to bind with its substrate. What's the difference between reversible and irreversible enzyme denaturation? 
Reversible denaturation is where the restoration of optimal conditions restores the enzyme's function as it regains its optimal shape. If you can imagine that an enzyme has an optimal shape at seven, you move it up a little bit, the enzyme starts to denature, but then if you restore the pH, the enzyme shape might go back to its previous form, thereby going back to its optimal rate of efficiency. But irreversible denaturation is where the enzyme shape is permanently changed and its catalytic ability is destroyed. And this isn't exactly with enzymes, but if you think about what happens when you cook an egg, the egg white goes from clear to a solid, and it'll never go back, even once you cool it back down. That's irreversible denaturation of a protein. Imagine the same for an enzyme. Explain how enzyme activity is affected by substrate concentration. With low substrate concentrations, the probability of the enzyme meeting its substrate is low, and the product is produced at a very low rate. As substrate concentration increases, the collision and the reaction rate will also increase, but at a certain point, you get to a saturation point. And at that point, all the enzymes have their active sites interacting with substrates, so there's a peak in the rate and you don't go any higher. Compare and contrast competitive and non-competitive inhibition. In competitive inhibition, a foreign molecule, one that's not part of the cell or the organism, that's not the enzyme substrate, so this is number four over here, blocks the enzyme's active site. And that keeps the substrate from binding, here's the substrate, and that inhibits the rate of the reaction. It's inhibiting by competing for the active site. In non-competitive inhibition, which is shown over here, a foreign molecule, not one that's part of the organism, binds away from the active site at a region that's called the allosteric site over here. So here's the allosteric site, here's the allosteric site that's occupied by this foreign molecule. Binding at the allosteric site causes a ripple effect throughout the protein that causes a change in the shape of the active site Therefore, the substrate can no longer bind at the active site, and that diminishes or blocks enzyme activity. Topic 3.4, cell energy. What is a metabolic pathway? A metabolic pathway is a linked series of enzyme-catalyzed chemical reactions occurring within a cell. So here you can see that these are all separate reactions, but they're linked together. Above, one, two, and three are all enzymes. A is the initial reactant. B and C are what we call intermediates. And D is the final product. Examples of metabolic reactions that you'll come to know well include glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, the Calvin cycle, all of which we'll deal with in this unit. And these reactions can be linear. So glycolysis is a linear reaction. You have a beginning point and an end point or they can be cyclical, like the Krebs cycle and the Calvin cycle. So for example, in the Krebs cycle, this compound over here, oxaloacetate, it's the beginning compound, gets modified, and it also comes back and it's the ending compound. A similar thing happens in the Calvin cycle. What are autotrophs? Compare and contrast photoautotrophs with chemoautotrophs. Autotrophs are organisms that can produce their own food. We are not autotrophs, but plants and certain bacteria and archaea are. So photoautotrophs include plants and cyanobacteria. They use the energy and light to create organic compounds that they need to survive through photosynthesis. Whereas chemoautotrophs include some bacteria, some archaea, archaea is that third domain. The energy for their life processes comes from a process called chemosynthesis, and that involves oxidizing inorganic substances, including iron, sulfur, or hydrogen sulfide. What are heterotrophs, and how do they get the energy and matter they need to live, grow, and reproduce? Heterotrophs capture the energy present in organic compounds produced by other organisms. They can be ecological consumers, decomposers, or parasites, and they get their energy and matter by metabolizing the organic compounds and organisms that they eat or absorb or in the dead remains of other organisms. Here's a heterotroph and here's another heterotroph. What's the difference between an exergonic reaction and an endergonic reaction? 
Exergonic reactions release energy and increase entropy. So here's an exergonic reaction over here, and the energy of the reactants is less than the energy of the products. And you can't see this, but like for example, if you burn a piece of paper or a piece of wood, you start with cellulose over here and you wind up with many unorganized atoms of carbon dioxide and water. So that's an increase in entropy because you've decreased organization. Cellular respiration, most hydrolysis reactions are exergonic reactions. Endergonic reactions require energy and decrease entropy. And examples include photosynthesis or almost any dehydration synthesis reaction. Describe the structure and function of ATP. Explain how ATP can be used to store and release energy. The structure of ATP involves a five carbon sugar that's called a ribose, a nitrogenous base that's called adenine, and three phosphate groups. The function of ATP is to power work within cells. Every cell makes its own ATP. There's no sharing of ATP between cells. And to store energy, what happens is that cells take energy from food during cellular respiration or light during photosynthesis and use that to combine ADP and a phosphate group into ATP. And to release energy for work, cells remove a phosphate group from ATP. They break off this terminal phosphate group, and that creates ADP and phosphate, and that makes energy available to do cellular work. What is energy coupling? Energy coupling is the linking of an extragonic reaction to an endergonic reaction, and that linking drives the endergonic reaction forward. Here's an example, cellular respiration, which is exergonic, drives the formation of ATP from ADP and phosphate. So this exergonic reaction is driving this endergonic one. And example number two is the exergonic conversion of ADP and P is coupled to endergonic processes such as active transport. We discussed that in our unit two review video that takes energy. So ATP to ADP and phosphate makes this endergonic reaction possible or muscle contraction. Also an endergonic reaction, it's made possible by the breakdown of ATP to ADP and phosphate. Photosynthesis parts one and two, the big picture and the light reactions. What happens during photosynthesis? What's its chemical equation? Is it endergonic or exergonic? In photosynthesis, using light energy, here's the sun, photoautotrophs like plants combine carbon dioxide and water to create carbohydrates. That's what the plant is made of. Oxygen is released as a waste product. It's the source of biomass and the base of almost every food chain. The formula is 6 CO2, 6 carbon dioxides, plus 6 H2O, 6 waters, with light energy to power the reaction, are combined into glucose, C6H12O6, and six oxygens. This is an endergonic reaction for two reasons. It takes two low energy inputs, carbon dioxide and water, and converts them into a high energy product, glucose. It reduces entropy. That means it increases organization. And you can sort of count that out. So there are 12 molecules on this side of the equation, and there are seven on this side. So we've taken something that was disorganized, made it into something more organized. Um, highly unorganized carbon dioxide, it's diffuse. It's a gas, and it's made into solid matter. And that's a huge decrease in entropy. When did photosynthesis first evolve? What are some of the consequences of photosynthesis? In terms of when, based on fossil and chemical evidence, about 3.5 billion years ago, that's relatively soon after the emergence of life, 3.8 billion years ago, its consequences were vast. First of all, when the Earth first formed, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. It's photosynthesis, which splits apart water to release oxygen that created the oxygen-rich atmosphere that made our aerobic metabolism possible. And it also created an ozone layer. That's a protective layer in the atmosphere that shields us from ultraviolet radiation and that made life on land possible. So we owe everything to photosynthesis. What are the two phases of photosynthesis and what does each accomplish? We start with the light reactions that's on this side of this diagram and it converts light energy into chemical energy. And that chemical energy is in the form of ATP 
and NADPH. You already know about ATP. NADPH is like NADH. It's an electron carrier. The Calvin cycle is the second phase of photosynthesis, and it converts the chemical energy that's in NADPH and ATP into carbohydrate, and it does that by using carbon dioxide as an input, and it fixes that low energy gas into high energy sugars. Describe the role of chlorophyll in photosynthesis. Explain the absorption spectrum of chlorophyll and other pigments. Chlorophyll is the pigment that absorbs light energy in photosynthesis. And here you can see its structural formula. It's got a hydrocarbon tail that enables it to fit into the phospholipid bilayer of the thylakoids. We'll talk about those in the middle. And it's really this structure over here, this nitrogen ring with a magnesium in the center that enables chlorophyll to help plants convert light energy into electrical energy, as we'll see in a little bit. An absorption spectrum shows the amount of light absorbed at different light wavelengths by a pigment, by a substance that absorbs light energy. And chlorophyll has two forms. They're different based on this functional group. Here's chlorophyll B, here's chlorophyll A, and you can see that they both absorb most energy in the blue part of the spectrum and in the red part of the spectrum, but very little in the green part of the spectrum. And that's why leaves are green, because leaves are reflecting green light, whereas they're absorbing other light wavelengths. There are other pigments that are also involved in photosynthesis. One's called a carotenoid, and they absorb other wavelengths. What is the action spectrum of photosynthesis? The action spectrum, which looks a little bit different from the absorption spectrum that we just looked at, shows how various light wavelengths drive photosynthesis. And blue and red drive the most photosynthesis, and green drives very little. This was determined by the Engelman experiment. Thomas Engelman in the 1800s did a cool experiment where he grew a filament of algae under light from a prism that divided the light up into its various wavelengths. and aerobic bacteria grew around the filament best in the blue and the red part of the spectrum. And they were able to do that because that's where the most oxygen was being produced. You can, in the lab, and I actually hope that you did, recreate this experiment with the famous photosynthesis spinach leaf disc experiment where these disks of spinach leaves will rise based on the amount of oxygen that they produced. And you can set different variables like the intensity of the light or the uh, wavelength of the light. Connect the structure of chloroplasts to the reactions of photosynthesis. So chloroplasts, where do you find them? So here they are. This is a cross section of a leaf. These are cells within the top part of the leaf. And these are chloroplasts. There are many per cell. There's only a couple shown here. And in terms of the structure of the chloroplast itself, it has an outer membrane and an inner membrane. The outer membrane is a vestige of the evolutionary origins of chloroplasts. There's DNA, which is a vestige of the fact that this was once an independent living cell. There's also ribosomes. They're there for the same reason. And then there are thylakoids shown at number five over here. Those are membrane-bound sacs, and they contain the membrane-bound photosystems and chlorophyll for the light reactions of photosynthesis. They're organized into these stacks called grana, and surrounding them is the stroma, which is essentially the cytoplasm of the chloroplast. It contains DNA, it contains ribosomes, and it's where the Calvin cycle occurs. So that's where carbohydrates are actually created. What do the light reactions produce? Where do these reactions occur? What are the inputs and the outputs? The light reactions convert the energy in light into the chemical energy of NADPH and ATP. NADPH is an electron carrier. It's like NADH in cellular respiration. ATP is the molecule that cells use to build things. It's the workhorse of the cell. Where does it occur? It occurs in the thylakoids. Oxygen is the waste product, as well as NADPH and ATP. And the inputs are light and water. The outputs of the Calvin cycle are the inputs of the light reaction. So NADP plus and ADP and P are the inputs. Those get fed into the light reactions. ATP and NADPH go out.
What are the key structures involved in the light reactions? So we have a chloroplast over here, and then at N we have a grana and a single thylakoid membrane. So this whole thing here is a thylakoid membrane. Within the thylakoid membrane, there are photosystems. Those are complex assemblies of proteins, and they have embedded chlorophyll molecules, those little green dots are chlorophylls. And those photosystems, those are the things that actually convert light energy, shown here at A and shown here at D, into a flow of electrons. This whole array is kind of like a solar panel that's converting light energy into electricity. They're also splitting water molecules, and that happens in photosystem too. Let's just get this out of the way right now. In the organization of the photosystems in the thylakoid membrane, photosystem two comes before photosystem one. For years, biology students have been memorizing that and you have to memorize it too. So this is the electron pathway through which electrons flow. And at one point, those electrons flow through proton pumps. They're labeled as cytochromes, but there's other stuff going on too. And what these do is they pump protons from the stroma into the thylakoid space. And over here is an enzyme called ATP synthase. And as the protons that are trapped here diffuse through this, they generate ATP. This is where NADPH is created. This is an overview. We're going to go through the details right now. Describe how the light reactions of photosynthesis create ATP. Photo excitation of chlorophyll in photosystem 2 leads to a flow of electrons along an electron transport chain in the thylakoid membrane. That electron transport chain, that's an electrical current, and it powers a device. In this case, the device is a proton pump that's embedded in the thylakoid membrane, and that pumps protons from the stroma into the thylakoid space. So here's the stroma, here's the thylakoid space. We're pumping from the stroma into the thylakoid space, and that creates a chemiosmotic gradient. Chemiosmotic, what does that mean? Well, there are all these protons that are over here, and there are very few over here. It took energy to do that. And that gradient is a diffusion gradient, and it's also an electrical gradient. And that causes these protons to want to diffuse from the thylakoid space back to the stroma. They can't do it through any part of the thylakoid membrane except through this channel that's called ATP synthase. The ATP synthase channel is also an enzyme, and as protons diffuse through, the kinetic energy of those protons is used to power an endergonic reaction of taking ADP and phosphate and making it into ATP. Now note that there's also this water-splitting complex that's part of photosystem Two. And what it does is it takes water molecules, splits them apart to create oxygen, that's a waste product, but also to create protons. And those protons accumulate in the thylakoid space that enhances the gradient and it powers additional ATP production. Describe how the light reactions create reducing power, NADPH, that can be used in the Calvin cycle. So we're going to start over here. We're looking at photosystem one photo excitation of chlorophylls in photosystem one is how the process starts. That creates a flow of electrons that's flowing through the electron transport chain of photosystem one. And over here, those electrons flow to this enzyme. It's called NADP plus reductase, and that reduces NADP plus into NADPH. Reduction, that's a thing from chemistry, Reduction is gain of electrons, so that NADP plus is going to gain electrons and uh, hydrogen, making it into NADPH. And why? Because during the Calvin cycle, that NADPH provides the electrons and hydrogens that reduce carbon dioxide into carbohydrates. Use the Z scheme to summarize the light reactions. So the Z scheme is a graphical representation of everything that happens in the light reactions. This axis over here, the y-axis, shows electron energy. So what happens? Light drives 
electron boosting from photosystem 2. Remember, photosystem 2 comes first. And so that electron goes to a much higher energy level. And at the same time, water is split apart into protons and oxygen gas. Then there's electron flow through the electron transport chain of photosystem 2. And that goes through proton pumps that power the synthesis of ATP from ADP and phosphate. Those electrons arrive at photosystem 1. They're relatively low energy at this point. You can see that by their position on the graph. But light comes in and it stimulates chlorophylls and another electron gets boosted to a high energy level into what's called a primary electron acceptor that's in the thylakoid membrane and that passes it off to the electron transport chain of photosystem one it flows to the enzyme nadp plus reductase and nadp plus reductase creates nadph from nadp plus and a proton so we have the two products of the light reactions atp and nadph beautifully explained by the z scheme photosynthesis part three We've covered the big picture and the light reactions, and now we're gonna talk about the Calvin cycle. What are the three phases of the Calvin cycle? So let's remember the Calvin cycle takes the products of the light reactions and carbon dioxide and uses it to create sugars. So that occurs in three phases. And the first phase is called the carbon fixation phase. Carbon dioxide gas is brought essentially into the biosphere. That is followed by the energy investment and harvest phase where matter is actually pulled out and that matter becomes part of the plant and ultimately part of you. And then finally, there's the regeneration of the starting count compound. This is a cyclical reaction. This compound, RUBP, ribulose bisphosphate, is at the end and it's at the start. Now we'll go into each phase. Describe what happens during the carbon fixation phase of the Calvin cycle. The fixation phase begins as carbon dioxide is combined with RUBP. That is a reaction that's catalyzed by the enzyme Rubisco. Fun fact, that might be the most abundant protein on Earth. It creates a six carbon product, which isn't shown. So think about this. RUBP has five carbons. Each of these black dots represents a carbon atom. CO2 has one carbon. You'd think that would create a six carbon product, but immediately that six carbon product dissociates into two three carbon molecules so that's how we end the carbon fixation phase describe what happens during the energy investment and harvest phase of the calvin cycle we ended the carbon fixation phase with this three carbon molecule and that three carbon product is reduced and phosphorylated so here's a phosphorylation in other words ATP contributes a phosphate to this molecule. This had one phosphate group. This one has two over here. So that's a phosphorylation and reduced. So NADPH donates an electron to this molecule. So at the end, we have this molecule, G3P, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. It's also called PGAL, phosphoglyceraldehyde. Those are both interchangeable names. And the key thing is that this has a lot more energy than this. Why? Because it was given that energy from ATP and NADPH. This molecule can now be harvested, taken out of the Calvin cycle, and used to build plants. This is the origin of the biomass in almost any ecosystem. It's the origin of your biomass because that's ultimately where it came from. Describe what happens during the last phase of the Calvin cycle. Before we do that, I want to talk about a way to think about the entire Calvin cycle that's really going to make you think about it in a more sophisticated way. And that way pays attention to the number of carbon atoms that are present at each stage of the cycle. So we talked about how during carbon fixation, RUBP is combined with CO2. But a more proper way and correct way to think about it is that it's three RUBPs. RUBP is a five carbon compound, so that's a total of 15 carbon atoms get combined with three carbon dioxides. 15 plus three is 18. And we've talked about how the three six carbon compounds immediately dissociate into two three carbon compounds. So what we have over here at the end of carbon fixation is six 
three carbon molecules. And that's a total of 18 carbons. Makes sense. 5 times 3 is 15, plus 3 is 18, and we've got 18 carbon atoms over here. Now, in the energy investment and harvest phase, during energy investment, we're just going to phosphorylate and we're going to reduce. We're adding energy, but we're not adding carbon. So what we wind up with over here is six molecules of G3P, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, 6 times 3 is 18. We had 18 over here, we have 18 over here. But what we're going to do in the harvest phase is we're going to pull one of those G3Ps out. So 18 minus 3, we're left with 15 carbon atoms, 5 times 3. Now during the next phase, these 5 G3Ps are rearranged by a variety of enzymes. That's why I have multiple en uh, arrows over here. And they're rearranged into 3 five carbon RUBPs. And along the way, a phosphorylation occurs, and that's, again, energy from the light reactions that's invested over here. And RUBP is one of the substrates of carbon fixation along with carbon dioxide. But now we've accounted for all of our carbons. We start with these 15 over here, 15 carbons, and after the whole process is done, we again have 15 carbons. And if you can explain that, you're set up for an A and a 5 on the AP Bio exam. And that is now an appropriate time for me to say congratulations because you've hung through one of the most difficult parts of this review. We're going to do cellular respiration next. You're a hero. Keep with it. You're going to get a 5 on the AP Bio exam. If you're watching this video, you're probably wondering, how am I going to get an A in my class and a 4 or a 5 on the AP Bio exam? At learn-biology.com, we understand why students struggle with AP Bio. The material is complex, the pace is brutal, and the vocabulary is ridiculous. AP Bio is hard. It's easy to feel overwhelmed and inadequate. To get that A or that 4 or 5, you need an easier way to study. And that's why we created learn-biology.com. It's an interactive AP Bio curriculum with tutorials that have quizzes, flashcards, and interactive diagrams that give you the feedback that you need so that your confidence soars and that you can easily get A's on your tests and a four or a five on the AP Bio exam. We have comprehensive AP exam reviews and a subscription comes with a money back guarantee. If you do the work, you'll succeed. I guarantee it. So here's your plan. Sign up for a free trial subscription at learn-biology.com, complete our unit reviews, and get ready to crush the AP Bio exam. You do not want to end the year with regrets. Learn-biology.com, your key to AP Bio success. Cellular respiration, the big picture. What's the chemical equation for cellular respiration? Is it endergonic or extragonic? Where in eukaryotic cells does it occur? The equation C6H12O6 or glucose plus six oxygens yields six carbon dioxides, six water molecules, plus energy in the form of ATP. It's an exergonic reaction. It releases energy and it creates disorder. It takes an organized molecule like glucose and creates much less organization over here. And it occurs in various phases. The first phase is glycolysis. That occurs in the cytoplasm. Then the link reaction brings the product of glycolysis into the mitochondrion. And in the matrix, we have the Krebs cycle. And then finally, the phase which produces the most ATP is oxidative phosphorylation. And that occurs based on enzymes and proteins along the mitochondrial membrane using the intermembrane space to create a chemiosmotic gradient. Briefly describe what happens in each phase of cellular respiration. Here we've got the whole process. Let's break it down. The process begins with glycolysis. So energy in glucose generates ATP and NADH. NADH, like NADPH that we met in photosynthesis, it's an electron carrier. And the end product is a three carbon molecule called pyruvic acid or pyruvate. One glucose, a six carbon molecule, becomes two pyruvates, which are each three carbon molecules. In the link reaction, what happens is that that pyruvate enters into the mitochondrial matrix and 
enzymes along the way convert it to a molecule called acetyl-CoA with two carbons. The carbon that's removed is released. That's one third of the carbon that you exhale. And that conversion is uh, powers the reduction of an NAD plus to NADH, and that's later going to be used in the electron transport chain. In the Krebs cycle over here, what enzymes do is they oxidize these two carbons in acetyl-CoA, and that powers the production of three NADHs, one FADH2, that's another mobile electron carrier like NADH, and it creates one ATP. That releases two carbon dioxides, and that's the other two-thirds of the carbon dioxide that you exhale. And note that for every glucose that enters cellular respiration, the Krebs cycle runs twice, as does the link reaction. And then finally, you have the electron transport chain, the ETC. And what that does is it takes these reduced products, these reduced mobile electron carriers, and it oxidizes them. And that creates electron flow that powers through chemiosmosis the production of ATP from ADP and phosphate. That's where most of the ATP during cellular respiration is produced. Cellular respiration parts two and three, glycolysis, the link reaction, and the Krebs cycle. What happens during glycolysis include phases, inputs, and outputs in your answer. I've got a great song about glycolysis that goes like glycolysis, come on sugar, come on sugar for the breakdown. It occurs in the cytoplasm. It doesn't require oxygen, it's anaerobic, and it has three parts to it, investment, cleavage, and energy harvest. In terms of investment, what happens is that enzymes phosphorylate glucose. So glucose is a starting compound. Enzymes aren't shown here, but are implied by the arrows take a phosphate from ATP and plant it onto intermediate compounds. By the end of that process, you have fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And that goes into the next phase where enzymes take fructose 1,6-bisphosphate loaded with energy and cleave it apart into two molecules of G3, P. G3P is the same molecule that gets harvested from the Calvin cycle of photosynthesis. In the harvest phase, enzymes, again indicated by these arrows, do two things. They take G3P and they oxidize it. That means it's going to lose energy, lose electrons, and those electrons go to NAD+. It's a mobile electron carrier which gets reduced to NADH, and that's later going to be used in the electron transport chain. In addition, there are other enzymes that take ADP and phosphate and phosphorylate it to ATP. They're using the chemical energy in G3P to bring that about. We're getting a gross energy yield of four ATPs. And that leads us to the next idea. What's the net yield of glycolysis? We get two ATPs. Why two, even though there are four over here? It's because two were invested at the start of the process. So we net two. And we also get two NADHs, one produced over here from this G3P, one produced over here. And we wind up with two molecules of pyruvate or pyruvic acid that's still loaded with energy and that's going to power the next phases of cellular respiration. What happens between glycolysis and the Krebs cycle? The answer is the link reaction. What we have ended glycolysis with is pyruvic acid, and that's transported across the inner and outer mitochondrial membranes. That's something that's represented by B in this diagram into the mitochondrial matrix. As that happens, enzymes remove a CO2 from this pyruvic acid. You see this carboxyl group over here? It's basically a CO2. And that is one third of the CO2 that you and any other animal that does cellular respiration, plants too for that matter, wind up releasing. Other enzymes oxidize the resulting two carbon molecule. So we had three carbons, now we're at something with two carbons. It's actually called an acetyl group. And the oxidation of that acetyl group, oxidation is loss of electrons. Where do those electrons go? They go to NAD+, a mobile electron carrier. We just met it in glycolysis. And that NAD+, gets reduced to NADH, and that has electron energy that can get used in the electron transport chain. Finally, enzymes take that acetyl group and they attach it to a carrier molecule called coenzyme A, and the result is acetyl-CoA. That's the starting point for the Krebs cycle.
Describe the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle, which I have a great song about, occurs in the mitochondrial matrix. And it's a cyclical series of reactions that generate NADH, FADH2, and ATP. It starts with enzymes. All of these are enzymes over here. Enzymes taking this two carbon acetyl group from acetyl-CoA and transferring it from oxaloacetate, also known as oxalic acid, to citric acid, which is also known as citrate. The alternative names of the Krebs cycle are the citric acid cycle or the tricarboxylic acid cycle, TCA cycle, and that's for this carboxyl group over here, this carboxyl group over here, this carboxylic acid over here. So three carboxylic acids, TCA cycle. What happens next is that enzyme after enzyme oxidizes citric acid. And oxidation is loss of electrons. Those electrons get transferred to the mobile electron carriers NAD+, which becomes reduced to NADH. That happens over here, over here, and over here. And there's also a reduction of FAD, another mobile electron carrier, to FADH2. Along the way, other enzymes over here power a substrate level phosphorylation of ADP and phosphate into ATP. There's actually a complication involving GTP, but you don't need to worry about that for an AP bio class. For each acetyl CoA that enters the cycle, one ATP, three NADH, and one FADH2 are generated. And that's probably worth memorizing. And CO2 is released as a byproduct. There's one over here, over here. That's the other two thirds of the CO2 that you exhale. And oxaloacetate is the starting and ending compound. And I put in bold everything that's worth committing to memory. That's the Krebs cycle. Cellular respiration part four, the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. Explain how the mitochondrial electron transport chain generates ATP. This is such a beautiful and important process. Let's go through it. So in the previous phases of cellular respiration, glycolysis, the link reaction Krebs, we've been creating NADH and FADH2. Those are mobile electron carriers. They've been accumulating in the mitochondrial matrix and they diffuse over to the inner membrane where they're oxidized. Oxidation is loss of electrons. Those electrons now flow through an electron transport chain. That's this yellow arrow over here. And that's a series of membrane embedded proteins that are in the mitochondrial inner membrane. So it's as if there's an electrical current that's flowing along the mitochondrial membrane through these various proteins. Notice that NADH comes in first. It has a little bit more energy in its electrons than FADH2, which drops its electrons off a little bit further on down the chain. Some of these electron transport proteins are proton pumps, and they pump protons from the matrix to the intermembrane space. Pumping is active transport that requires energy. Where's the energy from? It's from this flow of electrons. Notice that there's less protons over here and more over here. Again, active transport requires energy and that creates an electrochemical gradient. There's more protons over here, fewer over here. There's more positive charges over here. There's fewer positive charges over here. It's also a pH gradient because the pH is much lower in the intermembrane space than it is in the matrix. All those protons are trapped. Oxygen acts as the final electron acceptor. And what it's doing is it's so electronegative that it's pulling electrons down this electron transport chain. And as it does, it absorbs electrons and protons that are available in the matrix, and that increases the gradient. This is why you need oxygen to do aerobic respiration, because it's the final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain. Now, all of these protons have been accumulated here. They can't diffuse through any part of the inner membrane except through one channel. That's called ATP synthase. It's the same that we discussed when we discussed photosynthesis. It's a channel and it's an enzyme, 
as protons diffuse through, so that's diffusion, it's facilitated diffusion, their kinetic energy is used to create ATP from ADP and phosphate. That's how the electron transport chain generates ATP. Cellular respiration can be used to generate heat instead of ATP. Explain. In newborn humans and other mammals and hibernating mammals, there are cells that are called brown fat cells. They're extremely dense with mitochondria. That's where the heat is generated. When body heat is needed, hormones induce a protein channel called thermogenin or UCP. It's also called the uncoupling channel to form in the inner mitochondrial membrane. So here it is over here. Now notice, in normal cellular respiration, protons that are trapped have to diffuse through ATP synthase, which creates ATP. But now there's an additional channel. So protons diffuse back to the matrix from the intermembrane space without passing through ATP synthase. But all of this activity in the electron transport chain here called the respiratory chain still has to happen. And think about the fact that when electrons move through a wire that generates heat through resistance. Well, basically you can think of the electron transport chain as a wire. The electrons that are moving through it generate heat, but in this case they generate heat without generating ATP. And that's how cellular respiration can be used to generate heat instead of ATP. Cellular respiration part five, anaerobic respiration and fermentation. Compare aerobic and anaerobic respiration. Aerobic respiration, oxygen is required. It involves essentially the whole shebang of respiration that we've talked about, glycolysis, plus the link reaction, plus the Krebs cycle, plus the electron transport chain, generate a lot of ATP, 32 ATPs approximately for every molecule of glucose that enters the cycle. Most of the ATP is generated over here in the mitochondria. There's a small amount that's generated through glycolysis. Anaerobic respiration occurs when oxygen is lacking or insufficient, or I should add, when the organism doesn't have the enzymes to do aerobic respiration. Glycolysis is really the key part of anaerobic respiration. So it involves glycolysis followed by fermentation, and it generates a total of two ATPs, and it occurs entirely in the cytoplasm. The mitochondria are not involved. What is fermentation and why does it occur? Fermentation is glycolysis that's followed by reactions that regenerate NAD+. So here we have one form of fermentation. It's called alcohol fermentation. Here we have lactic acid fermentation. But the key thing is that they produce NAD+. That's kind of the opposite of what glycolysis does. Why does fermentation happen? It's because if you're an aerobic organism, but you need to uh, keep on moving and there's not enough oxygen available because you're working so hard, then you can continue to get two ATPs per every glucose. And that sure isn't as good as 32 or more that you get from aerobic respiration, but at that moment, you just can't do it. Glycolysis, however, can only create those two ATPs if NAD plus is available. It's a substrate for one of the reactions of glycolysis. So two ATP are better than none, and that's why animals like us that do lactic acid fermentation perform it when oxygen is unavailable. Compare and contrast alcohol and lactic acid fermentation. Alcohol fermentation, really what we're talking about is ethanol fermentation because there are other alcohol fermentations, occurs in yeast. When you're baking bread and you use yeast, you're doing an alcohol fermentation. Enzymes, shown over here, remove a carbon dioxide from pyruvic acid. Remember, that's the molecule that ends glycolysis. That produces acetaldehyde, and acetaldehyde is then, by other enzymes, reduced to ethanol. Well, reduction is gain of electrons. Something has to lose electrons, and NADH is oxidized to NAD+. That allows glycolysis to continue. Interesting and fun fact, 
This CO2 that makes up the bubbles in beer, which come about through an alcohol fermentation, that also makes up the bubbles that uh, cause bread to be spongy and have its spongy form. Now, lactic acid fermentation occurs in muscle tissue under anaerobic conditions. It's a little bit simpler than alcohol fermentation. What happens is that pyruvate is reduced to lactic acid, and again, um, as that reduction occurs, something has to be oxidized, and NADH is oxidized to NAD+. That allows glycolysis to continue. There are all kinds of anaerobic sports, like weightlifting or doing push-ups or things like that, and you're doing them at a level where muscle tissue can't really get enough oxygen. So during that time, they're doing lactic acid fermentation. You feel that lactic acid build up and then eventually you have to stop exercising until you can recover aerobically. How is ATP generation in mitochondria and chloroplasts similar? In unit three, we've talked about these two great metabolic reactions, photosynthesis and the electron transport chain of cellular respiration. And there are deep similarities to the way that they work. And this kind of cross-topic thinking is essential to your success in the AP Bio exam both of these processes use an electron transport chain to pump protons to an enclosed space, creating a proton gradient. And in photosynthesis, here's the electron transport chain. We're pumping protons from the stroma to the thylakoid space. In cellular respiration, we're pumping protons from the matrix to the intermembrane space. And both use a subsequent process of chemiosmosis, the fusion of protons through an ATP synthase channel to generate ATP. And that's not a coincidence. As we'll see in unit seven, where we'll talk about evolution, the similarities that are present between mitochondria and chloroplasts indicate that at some point in very ancient history, they had a common ancestor. ATP synthase evolved once, and then it became shared by the ancestors of chloroplasts and mitochondria. It's an incredible ride seeing biology and seeing evolution in process. Oh my goodness, I can't tell you how much I admire you for hanging on until this point and learning so much B-I-O-L-O-G-Y. I've got a couple of important messages. The first is, is that if you really want to crush your AP Bio course and the AP Bio exam, then sign up for that free trial at learn-biology.com. Our AP Bio reviews, our interactive tutorials, our quizzes, our flashcards, our games are going to help you get to the level that you want to get to for your AP Bio success. The second thing is that Science Music Videos has so much music related to AP Bio Unit 3. I'll put the links below. Have a big party. Sing these songs. It's a great way to learn this material. And finally, I want to let you know that our Unit 4 video is coming up. It's going to help you review that difficult material related to cell communication, cell division, cancer, apoptosis, feedback, homeostasis. I'll see you there.